Welcome everyone to 284 News. My name is Javon Wilson. I'm Kamal Hins. And I'm Ron Grant. And we are so thrilled and happy to be coming to you live out of the beautiful British Virgin Islands. The content continues via our website, 284media.com. In today's news, tax revenues in the BVA on the increase when compared to 2020. Our Premier Foy says we are on our way back. We also see BVI Tourist Board meeting with the Anigata Committee. Those are the business owners ahead of the Anigata Lobster Fest. And hearings to deliver outstanding evidence to the COI scheduled for month end. And Silk Legal not permitted to deliver final oral submissions. We also see Premier Foy honoring members of the armed services that would have lost their lives in the line of duty during his visit to the United Kingdom and also meeting with some of the Virgin Islanders, particularly our students, while in the United Kingdom. We have the details for these stories and so much more on today's edition of 284 News. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a brand new season of The Art of a Distinguished Gentleman, a show poised to help guide modern day men into 21st century distinguished gentlemen. It doesn't always involve suits and, uh, wait, bow ties, but raw, real life lessons that translate to grounded, community minded, well rounded men. This season, I'm taking you on an entirely different journey from chefs to dancers, philanthropists, communications specialists, and much more. I'm heading outside in the field to share the journey of some of the BBI's best and brightest men. From East End to West End, Bojangara, Jasmine, not forgetting Anigara. Our Virgin Islands gentlemen are doing the damn thing, and I'm so proud. Get ready to reason, reflect, and redirect. We are the movers and shakers of this generation, and we ain't afraid to show it. The Art of a Distinguished Gentleman, Season 3, by yours truly, Ron Grant, raising a generation of greatness. Welcome everyone, it's Monday, November 15th, 2021, I'm Kamal Haynes. And my name is Javon Wilson, of course, coming to you live out of 284 Media, 284 News your source for local, regional, as well as international content. Now, coming out of the weekend, we see Premier and Minister of Finance, Honorable Andrew A. Foy, having the privilege of meeting with some of our brightest young people from the Virgin Islands who are currently away studying or working in the United Kingdom. Persons attending the meeting in person and online at the BVI London House. Now, viewers, they are studying and working in various disciplines, including marine engineering, law, accounting, data management, and music, among many others. The Premier was heartened by the talent and skills being fostered. Now, viewers, Premier reminded uh, the students and the workers, of course, that, that they are the future of the Virgin Islands and that he looks forward to them returning home to help grow and strengthen the economy. The Premier also took the opportunity to update uh, them on the work of his government. He also responded to questions. Additionally, Minister for Health and Social Development, Honorable Carvin Malone, spoke about health and the Virgin Islands COVID-19 response plan. Of course, the Premier is away at a ministerial uh, council meeting, himself and a delegation representing the BVI, uh, of course, details of which we plan to get into later on in the newscast. And viewers now return to more news from the budget where tax revenues in the British Virgin Islands have been experiencing a steady surge when compared to figures in 2020, with taxes and on goods and services increasing by more than $4 million, while taxes received on money transfers are set to top over $2 million by year end. Well, this is according to Premier and Minister of Finance Andrew Foy, who made the disclosure while delivering the 2020 national budget in the House of Assembly last week. What Premier said, uh, these figures speak to the measures that his government implemented during the heightened periods of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has now resulted in the BVI returning to levels that others felt would never have occurred, especially at this present point. There were those at this time who said that the BVI will never be back. There were those who were saying at this time that other places were eating our lunch. But I'm here to say today that because of the measures we have put in place, we not only now have our lunch back, we have the entire store to get breakfast, lunch, and dinner. For 2021, hotel accommodation tax revenue for 2021 is estimated at just below $2 million. 
Taxes for motor vehicle rentals are estimated at $92,000, more than 2020 figures. Cruising permits revenue is estimated at $1.79 million, which is close to 2020 figures. Passenger tax C is estimated to rise at $442,000, up from $407,000 in 2020. And tourist arrival levy revenues are estimated at $840,000 compared to $691,000 for 2020. We are on our way back. Well, the finance minister also said that the BVI's economy was still in a very strong position, being able and being stable despite the many challenges experienced over the last four years. But well, this, was, this was, was backed um, with the increase in tax revenues on international trade, which he said rose by more than $3 million. And the revenues generated from trade licenses, which he said increased from 2020 by over $100,000 to now stand at over $1 million. When the pandemic struck in March 2020, your government took some decisive measures, which we said, although they were tough, were aimed at protecting the lives and livelihood of all people and economy from catastrophic damage. The level of economic activity that can be seen taking place is proof that we have been able to achieve this so far. And our economy remains stable and resilient after all it has been through in recent years. The stimulation of the economy through various measures assisted in reducing some financial burden on our systems while creating opportunity for business ideas, innovation, operations, and boosting activities where possible. For 2021, income and parole tax increased by approximately $500,000 over 2020's revenue to $48.6 million. Taxes and goods and services increased by $4.67 million over 2020 receipts to $210.3 million. Taxes on international trade increased by $3.69 million over 2020 receipts to $39.62 million. Revenues from money transfer fees are estimated at $2.315 million and custom fees at $350,000. Revenues from trade licenses also increased over $1 million from $906,000 in 2020. This is indeed an encouraging sign for aspirations of growing our small business sector, even during this COVID-19 era. In other words, the un entrepreneurial spirit in the Virgin Islands is highly stimulated. It's alive. History shows that the people of the Virgin Islands become stronger when faced with adversities. Well, the Premier attributed the increased tax revenues to the monies injected into the economy during the height of the pandemic in 2020, where his government pumped millions of dollars into businesses to prevent them from closing. The projected improvement in economic activity in 2021 came as no surprise following the stimulation of the economy from the rollout of the $40 million grant from the BVI Social Security Board in the third quarter of 2020. Do keep in mind that $10 million from that BVI Social Security Board grant was placed into an unemployment relief fund and managed by the BVI Social Security Board. Also, $7.5 million from the grant was paid to the National Health Insurance, where from the inception, previous governments had been delinquent in making payments. Along with the economic stimulus package, your government also injected resources into the economy by advancing the rollout of a number of public sector capital projects. The combination of these two measures, the grant and the capital projects, resulted in a vitamin boost for economic activity across many sectors, leading to a 2.2% upward revision of the projection for the overall growth in 2021 over 2020 compared to the 7.5% contraction that was forced forecasted. 
Our Premier Foy said his government is calling the sun that the BVI is not yet where it needs to be in terms of pre-pandemic numbers, but said the current growth is a positive sign that the territory will reach the, that stage with diligence, persistence and vigilance. Well, Jovan, this was um, actually some, 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 I guess, welcoming news in terms of when the Premier did um, deliver this budget to state that, you know, despite the, the horrid times that we would have gone through as a territory through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the territory was still coping the necessary revenue needed to help, keep it, to, help to keep the, um, the, the economy running. Absolutely. And of course, it is, uh, as leaders of the territory, it is almost like a responsibility to be able to inject hope, especially in difficult times. So I'm really happy to see the Premier being very enthusiastic about uh, how the economy is beginning to look up. But also, uh, of course, we will continue to hold the government accountable to ensure that collectively we are all working to ensure that uh, our economy bounces back better and more resilient than ever. As we move on, the Kongdong is definitely on to the annual and highly anticipated Anigata Lobster Fest. Now, viewers, ahead of the activities, the BVI Tourist Board saw it fitting to consult with a group of stakeholders in Anigata to ensure that the event is not only successful, but especially seamless, being that we are living through a COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the senior marketing manager, Kareem Nelson Hall, was on the ground to bring us updates. Listen in. Yes, we're very excited. We can't wait to see everybody. We've missed you all, so please come on down. That's the word and welcome from the Anigata community who are already feeling the excitement for the 2021 Anigata Lobster Festival. The two-day festival, which will be held from the 26th to the 28th of November, is the first major tourism activity for the island and territory since the almost 16-month industry closure due to COVID-19. Ten restaurants and a handful of tour operators are set to participate, and by all accounts are ready. Oh yeah, we are very much, very much excited, uh, being that we have been locked down so long with COVID, you know, COVID-19. And we look forward to it, you know, because you know, um, the sister islands are also looking forward to it because they want to get a getaway, you know, and um, free up a little bit and enjoy and get a lobster. Getting prepared. We are not fully prepared, but I am working on things right now as we speak, right? I'm in the, I'm in the back right now getting prepared to have my grills cover in case there is a rain, then I can go ahead and serve the public. News of the nine-year-old festival has garnered interest from tourists and international media and signals the restart of the 2021 tourism season, which has received full government support. Well, definitely government supports Anagata Lobster Festival and any other event that the Tourist Board puts on. It is so good to have Anagata Lobster Fest back with us and we want to welcome all visitors, whether from other islands or from outside the territory, to enjoy what the BVI and Anagata has to offer. Flex Charles also shared a word of welcome and caution to those okay. attending. Come on over to Anagata for Lobster Fest and have a safe Anagata Lobster Festival. Focus now continues to be transportation and safety as hundreds are expected to descend on the island. We're trying to gather as much taxi drivers on our sister island, on Anigata, and trying to get assistance from Tortola and Virgin Guada to try to assist us. So we will be ready for when Lobster Fest weekend comes. Are you confident that they will be ready? I am extremely confident that they will be ready. We have about, uh, we have the, the, the capacity to move about 200 persons at one time, so I am extremely confident that they will be ready. The festival will unofficially begin early on the evening of the 26th, and officials are cautioning that regardless of when you arrive, health and safety will be paramount. I have a lot of confidence in the Anigada people and the businesses um, to get the measures right, because we have been doing a lot of training leading up to the festival, and even close to the festival, like we're here now, doing our refreshers. We have had several training programs and they have demonstrated their, their commitment to comply with the government measures. We want them though to reinforce these measures during the festival. The Anigata Lobster Festival promises to be a fun and safe time for the entire family. Hi, my name is Kana Klein and I'm the chairman of the Anigata Lobster Festival. And I'm encouraging you guys to come on out on November 26th to the 28th for the ninth annual Anigata Lobster Festival. 
That was the chairman of the Anagata Lobster Fest closing things off. Mr. Carnell Klein, who is very hopeful in speaking with us and within his exclusive interview, Kamal, he did mention that the stakeholders in Anagata are so excited, especially since there literally has been a tourism drought, uh, particularly on those sister islands that uh, depend significantly on tourism. So to have this event, have it back and running, and, and just to see us moving forward with life despite uh, the atrocity the tragedy that is COVID-19. I think it really speaks to uh, our character as a people, our resilience and our willingness to commit because also on the ground was Mr. Uh, Michael Lionel. Michael, sorry, he's the chief environmental officer and he was very confident uh, based on the commitment that was given by many of those business owners in Anigata. So I think we can safely say that we're looking forward to a successful Anigata Lobster Fest. Yes, we are. We are all looking forward to it. And uh, as you said before, um, it, it will contribute significantly to those vendors that would have missed out last year as well mm -hmm. um, with all that they have in store for this year. So, you know, fingers crossed, everything goes according to plan. Well, viewers, up next, hearings to deliver outstanding evidence to the COI schedule for month end and Silk Legal not permitted to deliver final oral submissions. And we also see Premier Foyle honours members of the armed services that lost their lives in the line of duty during his visit to the UK. For all these and more stories after a word from our sponsors. You value traditions. To You value music. You value education. Family. I love you. <laughs> Service. Thank you. You're welcome. Love. Life. At Popular, we're committed to you and everything our community values. For the things you value the most, count on us. Popular. Well, welcome back, viewers. But well, the, the Commission of Inquiry sorry, has announced new dates for further evidence hearings, which will commence on November 24th. But the announcement was made by the COI Secretary Stephen Chandler in a media release issued on Thursday, November 11th. Well, according to Chandler, the first of these hearings will see Governor John Rankin presenting further evidence. Well, he said, and I quote, but the logistics are detailed um, timetable for that hearing are not yet finalized, but that evidence will include further oral hearings from Her Majesty's Excellent Governor John Rankin Following the provisions of additional documentary evidence on behalf of the elected ministers, the commissioner also intends to take oral evidence from a small number of other witnesses. Well, those witnesses will be confirmed shortly, having received a list of those matters on which they wish to file joint closing witness um, written submissions. The commissioner has given the attorney general and the elected ministers permission to do so, limited to 20 pages. He also said that he has stressed the importance of the adhering to that page, count and quote. Well, the secretary further said that once these submissions are received, Commissioner Sir Gary Hickenbottom will consider if there is a need to hear oral submissions from counsel instructed on behalf of the Attorney General and the elected ministers. Well, he added that any oral submissions are likely to be limited to matters arising from the written submissions. Well, um, Secretary Chandler also disclosed that the law firm Silk Legal will not be allowed to present oral closing submissions as they did not abide by the commissioner's order or his guideline. But Chandler said, and I quote, well, Silk Legal on behalf of the members of the House of Assembly, except the elected members and the Attorney General, have neither submitted a list of any matters upon which they wish to make closing submissions as required by the commissioner's 2022 I'm sorry, 22nd of October 2021 order, nor have they applied for an extension of time to do so. Well, similarly, they have neither filed submissions in relation to the Seacouse Bay project, which they have previously indicated they may wish to do, nor sought an extension of time. In the circumstances, Silk Legal will not be permitted to make oral closing submissions, end quote. The Charles said it is the Commissioner's intention to deal with all outstanding um, evidential matters and any final oral submissions during that day. Uh, well, Javon, obviously we would have heard, heard previously the uh, Commissioner did state that, you know, the, the, or the, uh, the evidence stage was completed, but he did stress the fact that there was some uh, key important information that was still missing, hence why they would have announced now uh, come next week that they will be reopening hearings just for this specific day to allow those persons that didn't get an opportunity um, to submit the evidence in time to do so. 
All right, and we trust that that process will move seamlessly so that we could move forward with this process. Now, viewers, as we move on, the premier of the Virgin Islands, like we indicated earlier, Honorable Andrew A. Foy, uh, laid a wreath at the UK's Remembrance Sunday service at the Cenotaph in London's Whitehall on Sunday, the 14th of November. Now, viewers, the service of remembrance commemorates members of the armed services who lost their lives in the life the line of duty, sorry. This year marked the first time that a serving premier had the privilege of laying a wreath on behalf of the territory. Now, in 2019, Ms. Tracy Bradshaw, interim director and the BVI UK EU representative, laid the wreath on behalf of the Virgin Islands, which marked the first occasion that the territory was able to lay a wreath in its own right. Now, speaking afterwards, Honorable Foy said, and I quote, I am humbled that my first official task upon arriving in the UK was to lay a wreath on behalf of the people of the Virgin Islands on this Remembrance Sunday and to pay tribute to the men and women uh, of the Commonwealth, including the West Indies, who made the ultimate sacrifice during uh, World War I. Now, while laying the wreath, I remembered and gave thanks to those noble Virgin Islanders who are military veterans and had served in the armed forces which such courage. I was also honored to lay the wreath alongside leaders from other overseas territories." End of quote. Now viewers, the Cenotaph is a war memorial on the Whitehall in London, England, and it's the site of the annual National Service of Remembrance, which is held at 11 a.m. on Remembrance Sunday. The poppy, as we all know, is the enduring Sikh symbol of remembrance for the First World War. It is strongly linked to the Armistice Day, which is on 11th, uh, the 11th of November. But the poppy's origin as a popular symbol of remembrance lies in the landscapes of the First World War. Poppies are a very common sight, as you may know, particularly on the Western Front, and provided inspiration for the famous poem, in Flanders Field. In response to the poem, American humanitarian Moina Michael campaigned to make the poppy a symbol of remembrance of those who had died in the war and is now means to raise is now a means, sorry, to raise money for the thousands of former service men and women every year. Now, viewers, the Premier and Minister of Finance, Honorable Andrew A. Foy, uh, is attending the annual Overseas Territory Joint Ministerial Council meeting in the United Kingdom, which will be the first JMC in-person meeting since 2019, of course, due to COVID-19. According to the Director of Communications, Dr. Arlene T. Penn, while in the UK, the Premier will meet with new Overseas Territory Minister, the Right Honorable Amanda Millen, and of course, other UK ministers and OT leaders with whom he will discuss priority areas for engagement and cooperation. Talk about killing two birds with one stone. Of course, uh, of course, Premier considers this uh, an honor to be able to make such a significant representation uh, for those persons who would literally were able to serve as martyrs in the fight for freedom and for our safety uh, across. Uh, the region and we're so happy to see that he could have made that representation while also representing the Virgin Islands at this ministerial meeting. Indeed and we also see um, obviously the situation of COVID getting better with ministers and, and the Premier now being able to be at these um, significant events in person. Yes and you know one thing that I really do applaud about the Premier if you look at one of the pictures I'm not sure if we have that one here but the premier of the Virgin Islands was literally the only representative that was wearing a mask. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's commendable and it really speaks to how serious we are taking COVID-19. So kudos to our premier. Indeed. Well, viewers, up next, the majority of the 700 plus annual calls received by the Virgin Islands Fire and Rescue Service are medically related and plans to implement EMT initiative. And we also see 20 residents are now British Overseas Territory citizens. We get to these stories when Twit4 News return.
Well, viewers, thank you for sticking with um, thank you for sticking with us. Well, despite not receiving a large number of fire-related reports so far for the year 2021, the Virgin Islands Fire and Rescue Service is anticipating that they will receive approximately north of 700 calls by year end, with most medically related. But this is according to the Chief Fire Officer Zabla McLean, who made a statement during a recent interview with Two Eight Four News. Well, he said that the most calls received are not fire-related, but they fall within the spectrum of the many other responsibilities of the Virgin Islands Fire and Rescue Service. As for the fires, we have calls every single day. By the time the year has ended, we would have amassed over six to 700 calls. So while we may not have a lot of fires per se, we do have a lot of calls. The reason why we don't have a lot of fires, fortunately, is because of a relatively small size. It doesn't take a long time for us to get to the scene of a fire to stop it before it spreads. It doesn't take a long time for persons to realize that they, there's something leading to a fire for them to deal with it. But then we have a plethora of other different things that we have to attend to. We attend to medical calls, we attend to various res um, rescues, we attend to special services, to requests for all manner of different services, well, from anything from liquor license inspections to inspections of homes that have just been constructed to newly designed office buildings. So we are kept pretty busy. And in terms of well, Chief Fire Officer McLean said that as a result of the large volume of medical calls and responses, his department has been aiming to implement an EMT initiative which would help to benefit the territory. Calls you would get would be for medical response. We're currently trying to implement an EMT initiative. As, you, as I'm sure many persons know, most of the fire services around the world have EMTs and their own ambulance. This serves to assist the medical services when it comes to retrieving, stabilizing, and transporting medical victims. So the BVI should not be far behind. We have a robust tourist industry that are trying to once again relaunch. So we need to have these things in place. So the most calls we're getting these days are medical calls. Um, the second most we get would be calls for rescue. And then after that, we'd have actual fire calls, whether house fires, bush fires, car fires. Mm -hmm. our... Well, the chief fire officer said that the second most calls are for rescues, while fire-related calls are the third most calls received. All right, viewers, as we move on to close out today's newscast, 20 individuals are now British overseas citizens after reciting the Oath of Allegiance and Pledge of Loyalty to the United Kingdom during the British Citizenship Registration Ceremony that was held on November 12th. Now, viewers, His Excellency the Governor John J. Rankin, CMG, offered congratulations to the new citizens during the British citizen, Citizenship sorry, Registration Ceremony that was held uh, just recently. Governor Rankin said, and I quote, I hope as you exercise your new freedoms for travel and employment, you will never forget that you will be ambassadors for your home base, the British Virgin Islands, where all of you have been put uh, down roots. No doubt your contribution to the development of this community has already been substantial, and I hope it will be increasingly so in the years ahead. I congratulate you on having uh, persevered with the process and for having demonstrated your allegiance to the United Kingdom as well as your home in the Virgin Islands. He went on to say, and I quote, the new freedoms you will now enjoy also comes with new responsibilities. Uh, uphold our shared values, including respect for the, uh, the democratic rights, sorry, and freedoms, and respect and concern for others less fortunate than ourselves, end of quote. Now, viewers, the Register General and Chairperson for the ceremony, Mrs. Stephanie Ben, congratulated the new citizens and acknowledged that the ceremony confirmed their registration as British citizens, which should not be taken lightly. And quickly, we'll go through the names we have uh, to congratulate Ms. Shahida Adolphus, Kennedy Banda, Johanna uh, Barrett Diaz, we also have Elian Fraser, Manny Chen Jiwar, Kadicha Harry. Lurleen Higgins, Ayanna Hogan, Charlene, Charlene, Charles Dunn Joseph, sorry, uh, Eunice Wan, we have Cedric King, Dion King, 
Anne Marine Matthews, Philip Anthony uh, Musterat. We also have Daniela Marillon, Jazzy Palmer, LaFleece Prince, Lena Richardson, Dennis Michael Ricketts, and of course, Albina Septus. Congratulations to all of you, and of course, we wish you well. That's all the time we have for today. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Kamal Haynes. Viewers, have a good Monday.